Hey everybody, uh, this is Scott with Pray Five. Um, this is gonna we're gonna finish up on on this uh, topic tonight. I'm gonna go pretty quick. I know I'm a, about a minute early, but that's okay. Um, the what we're looking if you're just coming in, this is gonna be on hell, Satan, what they are and what they're not. Uh, we went over Satan. We'll have a couple more points that we'll we'll hit on, but tonight I'm gonna go through scripture. If you're taking notes. Um, I'll try to go slow enough so you can you can write down the passages. I don't suggest that you try to write the <laughs> write it out and just write down the passage where where I'm getting this from, uh, because there are uh, a lot. I'm gonna go through them pretty quickly. Um, the but first of all, let's go ahead and pray in, shall we? Father, thank you for this time together. Your blessings, your mercy, your grace. We ask for your truth from your Holy Spirit to be spoken and to be heard. We ask that you would protect and bless and watch over Israel. Bless her troops and her government. Give them wisdom and discernment against the enemy. To spread your gospel not only through Israel, but also through Gaza. We ask that you would, uh, those the enemy, that they would be ratted out and uh, would be killed. Um, that this, there's, this is a time to kill. We ask that you would uh, spread your gospel on both sides, that the innocent people on the side of Gaza that are just caught in the middle, would you please protect them also? In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Okay, you notice that I prayed also for Gaza because there's those people in there, uh, even the Israelis that we're listening to, uh, and my friends that are over there, that they're saying that the average run, everyday person over in Gaza, the, the Palestinians that are there, are just normal people. They dis, they don't like like each other, but they don't want to don't come over to try to do what they did. Uh, it's the Hamas that's keeping these people in bondage because they don't want to let them go because they're a human shield. Uh, the kind of a running sick joke that you'll see pictures of, you'll see a hole dug in the ground, and one's on the Israeli side, one's on the on the uh, uh, Muslim side or the Gaza side, and what you'll see is you'll see a hole dug, and you'll see the Israeli with his family in there, him standing up, fighting. And then you'll see the terrorists, the Hamas terrorists or Hezbollah or Jihad with the family with all his weapons in the hold, protecting him and putting people up in front of him. They don't give a rip about human life because they're wanting to go see their God, which I'm sorry, but their God that they worship is going the same place they are. Um, what we're, we see coming out of Israel, I won't go over the details. I'm dang sure not going to put any of the videos up here. If you're a glutton for punishment, uh, you can go to Telegram, the uh, the uh, deal, uh, the uh, the app, Telegram, either on PC or uh, laptop, or I mean, it's really easy. You can go to to Amir A M I R Surfati, which is T S A uh, R uh, F T I Surfati. I did it wrong. Yeah. Anyway, Amir Surfati, um, and the thing is. You will see more videos that will make you want to puke. Okay, I know I'm being graphic because I'm angry. Um, I can understand soldiers fighting soldiers, okay, or blow, or even attacking some civilian targets, you know, through collateral damage. Okay, that's part of war. But what was done was pure evil. When they came in, they, the Israelis have already started talking to and interrogating some of the. The, these monsters that came in, which are being supported by Iran, Persia. And Hezbollah is supported by Persia and North Korea and Russia. Okay, so the thing is, the head of the snake is in Persia. And Persia is helping them. Russia is in bed with them. And Turkey is, is going to have to line up with them also. Okay, according to Ezekiel 38 and 39. The thing is, what they did was so overly gross and just absolutely demonic. I mean, everything, I'm not going to, if you have young ears, they're not going to know these terms. So like necrophilia, you know, of their victims. And I won't, you know, you can explain that to your children. They don't, no, I'm not going to know what that term means. But that was just, that was just some of what was going on. They had videos. They showed, finally showed the media who was letting just kind of, oh, everything's kind of going to settle down in a couple weeks. Y'all need to. Not go up and blow up all these buildings. You gotta, they kill 1,400 of your people so you can kill some of theirs. No. 
the evil, just like in Germany, when uh, they had the SS, the the one of the judges before he hung a guy in the Nuremberg trials, he said, the reason we're killing these people is not because of just the, what they did, but because the evil is so bad that it must be eliminated. And because it, you, there's no coming back from that. This is to show the head of the snake must be cut off. And the head of the snake is Iran. Um, right now, our soldiers are now in harm's way. Boots on the ground. You keep watching on the news. The liberal news will give you a piece of it, but they won't give you all of it. Go to One American News. You can go to, like say, Amir Sharfati. Uh, Sarfati, T S A R F A T I, Amir Sarfati on Telegram. Get close, it'll show you. And it'll behold Israel. He's a major in the military, a retired major in the military. I'm sure he's going back into active service, probably. And he's a Christian. He's a messianic believer. So, what they were showing these these uh, people, these journalists, so that they would put out the right stuff. I was watching. There's different. Journalists go to different, like even CNN and the different ones. I was listening to the reporters and I was listening to the military, which you can do the same thing. They all said the exact same thing when they watched this 45-minute video. They said, and I won't get into the details because it will give you nightmares. I do not suggest you watch them. It is absolutely horrific. Uh, I wished I hadn't have seen some of it, uh, but I needed to to see just how evil we're talking about because I thought it was might have been inflated to for propaganda. No. They didn't do it enough. Um, there's no re there's a reason why they don't show this on show what actually all the things that happened on the national news. It's too it's too. Uh, some of the people that were there had to go to the hospital with uh, cardiac arrest, with uh, arrhythmias, and with anxiety attacks because it was so horrible. But everyone that talked about it, um, George Thomas from uh, CN C uh, CBN News, who's been a war correspondent for 28 years, says it's the worst thing he's ever seen. Bibi Netanyahu, the Prime Minister of Israel, said he's a war vet. He has seen many battles, many travesties in wartime. He said, I've never seen anything that bad. All of their all of their soldiers they spoke to all said the same thing. The war vets that have seen this have all said the same thing. They said that the evil that was done was absolutely more than they've ever seen. So that's what they're dealing with. It's not good, it's not one military against another, it's good versus evil. These people follow a different god, Moloch. The one that they call Allah is the same god as Moloch. Okay, so I'm going to get a lot of hate mail. Please don't send it because I'm not going to read it. Um, but it is what it is. But we are to pray for these people just like we would if somebody was a, a Zeke or a Buddhist or a, 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 a Mormon or a Jehovah's Witness. We would pray for them the same. We are commanded to pray for all our enemies. Go to war against them if necessary, but you're also to pray for them. Is, is to pray for your enemies. We as Christians, we don't have the option of hating them. We hate what they're doing, and what what these people did, they need to be eradicated. Yes, because they're so evil. But can God touch some of those people's lives? Well, we got witnesses to that. The people have that come out of that that God's talked to, that have. But you can't let this slide. Israel is completely justified. You say, well, what about the what about all the stuff they did? You're talking about a piece of land this big, on a map that has Muslim lands all around her, this big, literally, millions of square miles. And they're wanting to say, well, you took this little piece of land from us. This is really ours, even though historically we show archaeology that they were there three thousand years ago, long before the the Muslims ever existed. Okay, so. If you're wanting to be, what is biblical about this? I'm getting into it because the people that did these things are going to go to what we're going to talk about tonight. Okay, so this, unless they have a change of heart, unless they uh, repent, which most people don't, um, the thing is, knowing where hell is and what and what it is and what it isn't, the people who are in this country who are are uh, coming, are pedophiles are coming after children are going to the same place. They may not have as much torment or more because they, they, they're hurting children uh, or the ones that approve of it or our governments that are pushing it are going to have the same torment that these people that in Israel did what they did. Same, the same God is being followed by, these, by two different groups. One is trying to uh, use our children as sex objects. The other one is, is, is murdering them after, the, after they do horrific things to them. Same, same. Same God, different name. Um, 
trying to think of the points I was going to make on that. I guess I slipped my brain. But um, sorry, guys. The I'm just I'm angry. My ears are. I say my ears are burning. That means I, I, it just makes me angry. It makes me want to. If I was a young man, strap on a <laughs> strap on a gun and go help. <laughs> but that may be coming to our shores. I believe that our shores are. are, are it's just it's just a matter of time till it, till, till it's our turn. Um, unfortunately. So, what do we do? How do we love our enemy? Pray that God would spread His Holy Spirit through that they're that they're old and young would dream dreams and see visions and dream dreams of Jesus Christ, and that Christ would come and see them, including the bad ones. We can't just we can't just cut out one and say because we hate we hate them because of what they did. We're asking that Christ go and talk to them, just like we would anybody else. That's our, we don't as Christians. That's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to pray for our enemies. Uh, also. Pray for the blessings and the peace and the restoration of Israel because Jesus said that. We are commanded to pray for, for the peace of Jerusalem. Jerusalem is all of Israel. Okay? In other words, the capital of Israel. Um, the sad thing that we found out today through one of the interrogations I was watching that the IDF was doing, uh, Israeli Defense Forces, uh, they, were, they put it on... On television, you can watch them yourself. You can look it up. It's all over the internet. Is that these guys were being saying they're being paid ten thousand dollars per Jew to murder them? They were dragging them back to you know. You see the ones being drugged back. They're getting paid for everyone they bring back or they kill that they have evidence. Um, in the area that they attacked, you say, "Where's the weapons?" Israelis are supposed to be harmed. I was surprised there's only found out only 10% of the Israelis are armed that aren't military. Try that in Texas or Oklahoma or any other state that has a common sense to arm their citizens. The thing is, but the people that they got, the, those kibbutz in the area, were actually liberal, left-wing, liberal-believing uh, people, which that's beside the point. And they were actually for the people of Palestine. They were actually... Trying to, they were wanting to uh, share and to to help them, and those people came in and attacked the people that were trying to help them, and did what they did. Okay, pray that the soldiers are are, are the Israeli soldiers and those helping them uh, have strong heart and have, are keep them safe from harm's way, supernaturally touch their hearts and to spread your, their God, Christ's gospel through their ranks. And that the enemy would lose heart and would absolutely have confusion, disorganization, lack of communication, run out of food, water, everything, that, and just would just take away their spirit to fight. Just turn them into cowards. Okay? Just like God has done before in the past and even turned them on each other, which is going to happen. Real quickly, one of the prophecies that we, we know in Ezekiel 38 and 39 where it says that the enemy of Rosh, Gog, Magog, Tubal, Tugarma, Cush, Ethiopia, um, the uh, who is Gaddafi? He was um, over Libya, and the 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 half of Libya because they split will be are going to be on the northern border, and they're going to come across just north of the border of the Golan Heights. We know is Syria. That's where the Russians have their base. What's also north of, started looking at it, I didn't think about this till last week. What else is also north of the, of the border of Israel? Lebanon, that we're shelling right now. Where is Hezbollah, which is way bigger, way better trained, way better equipped than Hamas, is there. Their headquarters, Damascus, Syria, which is going to be destroyed, completely destroyed, annihilated. That's where the bad guys, that's where the leadership is. That's the head of their snake. Okay. They're going to attack. When you see Russia, Iran, which is Persia, and Turkey, and all those, the other ones I just mentioned coming in from the north, they're coming into Israel through the mountains. That's when you're going to see Gog Magog. That's when God's going to destroy them because it's going to be so massively big that Israel won't be able to do it on their own. Okay. Keep looking for that. Okay. Let's go ahead. It says, uh, uh, like I was telling you last week, I said we don't need to know, we don't need to know Greek or Hebrew to be able to clearly see that hell is real and eternal. 
the one who uh, instructed the men what to write, the 40 authors, that were, or the 40 men that were used to write the Bible, uh, were told by the God, the Holy Spirit, what to, what to put down. And the Christ, who is God, Yeshua, he was telling them, he, he, tell, he spoke more of hell than he did heaven. Next week I will, you know, I've given all the doom and gloom. I will. I decided uh, that this week I'm going to study on passages of heaven. Not near as much as hell. I mean, a lot less. But it just as poignant, and just as those of us that want to go there, he tells you how. How to be forgiven, repent, be forgiven no matter what you've done. Christ says that even one of these terrorists that did what they did, if they were to repent and turn to Christ and ask for forgiveness and accept Him as their Savior, he would forgive them of the atrocities they did. And you say, oh, no, 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 that can't be. Well, we're just as guilty of, of violating his law and, his, and, and sinning against him as anybody else. Just ours may not be nasty like that, but it's still a sin that keeps you out of heaven if it's not forgiven. Okay. Are these, uh, Jesus, uh, they, we're going to show a lot of the, the statements that Jesus made. He did 46 of them. And I'll go really quick over them. I'm not going to explain them all. Um, I'm going to try to hurry. Let's go ahead and get started with this. There are many more references in the Old Testament, which we t I talked about. I'm not going to go over those. Um, Jesus used the word fire, lake of fire, eternal torment, hell fire, the pit, outer darkness, and a, and a few other things. All, re all context was in the same thing. Uh, he also used, like I told about last week, that he said, you'll go to hell where the worm dieth not. Okay, and we, we saw that last week when you went to Mark 9, 44. Uh, let me see, 46 and 48. Mark 9, 44, 46 and 48. Um, the lake of fire is forever. Lake of fire. What is the difference between hell and the lake of fire? Okay, there is a difference. Remember, before Christ went to the cross, there were four different places. Okay, and on the four places, you had heaven, hell, paradise, and the lake of fire. If you remember the thief on the cross, when he when he Christ said, uh, he the the thief said, "Remember me this day, Lord, when you entered into your kingdom." He recognized who he was. He said, "I tell you the truth, that this day you will be with me in paradise." So Christ didn't go into the bowels of the earth to to take to preach his victory to the to the lost. Yet he went to paradise first, his own words, and he said. So therefore, that was paradise, but that was the last time spoken of. Because when he completed the covenant and Pentecost was completed, which was, uh, he, he was resurrected three days after that, then there was 40 days and he ascended, then 10 days later was Pentecost. Um, the he no longer speaks of paradise anymore. So now we, we have heaven, there's hell, and then there's a lake of fire. Now when a believer dies, they go straight to heaven. And the, the, there's the judgment seat of Christ. And that's in 1 Corinthians chapter 3.13 and uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. Okay, it talks about that. That's just two of the places. That's the two main places I, I go to. But it does talk about hell. But it says at the end of time, at the end of the thousand-year reign, hell, death, well, I mean, hell and the sea and the, and the grave will give up their dead. It said he'll, they'll all be judged. And then hell and death and sin will be cast off from the lake of fire. Hell right now, if you die as an unbeliever, you go to hell. And it's like going to county jail, waiting for prison. You know you're guilty and they've already got all the evidence. You're just waiting until, until your judgment day. That means if you die now, you there's going to be a thousand year time where you're going to be sitting there, plus whatever's between now and then, knowing that you're getting, you're, at the, when it's all said and done, you're going to a lake of fire. There is no partying. There is no water. There's no fun. All hope is stripped. All... Uh, all happiness, all literally all physical moisture, all light. Um, it's, it's darkness. It can be felt, um, and you're gonna ha you're gonna suffer with this, knowing that what you're in then isn't the worst. Which are that's just the prelude. Okay, so it says um, it talks about hell after the judgment. Then it says Satan, his angels will be tossed off into the lake of fire, where the false prophet and the antichrist, the beast, are still alive after a thousand years. They didn't get burned up, so that throws out the the Jehovah Witness thing, saying if you get tossed into the hell, you get you, you just get disintegrated. Well, if I believe that, I'd be less likely to 
you know, it, it, it's, well, okay, I'll live my life and won't know anything. I won't know any better. That's not what Christ says. That's why we need to know who, what hell is, what the lake of fire is, because to avoid it. These churches don't like the Joel Steens and all of them don't don't teach this because it's unpleasant. Because if you scare people, they're thinking, I don't want to go there. Well, that's the idea. That's why Christ spoke about it himself 46 times. And the deceiver, which is Satan, that's it, that's what his name means, is deceiver. Um, he's wanting you to think, oh, I'm a red pit, red skin, pitchfork tail, everything. And you know, hell is not re hell is just a place to go party and with your friends. Nothing could be, could be further from the truth. Okay. Revelation 20.10 says the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are current, present tense. Actually, it's in our future. Are. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. This is Jesus talking. That's Revelation 20, verse 10. 20, verse 10, Revelation. That's how we know that what I just said to you. Matthew has a lot to say about this. Let's go ahead and go into this. When I go into Matthew chapter 5, uh, it talks about in verse 22. It says, uh, let me go ahead. I got time. It says, but I say to you, whoever's hungry, whoever's angry with his brother, without cause shall be in danger of the judgment. In other words, Christ says, if you hate your brother, you're guilty of murder. Maybe not stabbing him in the chest, but you're guilty of murder mentally. You can sin mentally. Christ says if you look at a woman and lust in your heart after her, and then you committed adultery, you, you committed adultery in your heart, you're guilty of that. So yes, you what you think, you can sin mentally. Because you sin mentally before you sin physically most of the time. It says, whoever says to his brother, Racha, Racha, R-A-C-A, is uh, empty-headed, senseless. In other words, oh, he's an airhead, is what we call him. And, you know, a goober, didn't think, okay? He said, anybody that calls his brother that shall be in danger of the council, in other words, of judgment. In other words, he's telling us how to treat people. But whoever says, you fool, exclamation mark, if you look at it, shall be in danger of hell fire. Okay? The torment in hell is not the final judgment, but he says hell fire. It means there's heat. In hell, physical heat, physical torment in hell, but it's, hell is cast off in the lake of fire, and it's summit going from the frying pan into the, into the fire. Okay, Matthew, uh, that was Matthew five twenty two, Matthew five twenty nine uh, through thirty. Um, this is the one I was telling you about. It says, "You heard said that you shall not commit adultery, but I tell you that anyone who gazes at a woman in lust after her has already committed adultery." committed adultery with her already in his heart. She's not guilty. She may not even, the woman who you're looking at may not even be aware of that you're looking at them. This can be male or female, straight or gay or whatever. Okay? If it's not one man, one, man, one woman, then anything uh, sexual out of, out of the wedlock is sin. It means if you're a single guy, he says you're guilty of adultery. It didn't say whether you're married or single. If you're single and you're thinking of somebody, somebody, even the woman you're dating, or the man, if you're a woman, then and you're not married, that's adultery. Okay. Now, if I'm if I'm married, if you're a man or woman married, and you're thinking about your spouse, I'm not saying that because he says if you look at a woman, if it, if he's referring to your spouse, he'd say your wife. The wife would be referred. There's a di distinction between the two. So I can think about my wife in a way that's inappropriate for me to think about anybody else on the planet. Okay. And that's healthy if you're if you're married, you know. Won't go any further than that. Um, but he goes in here and he says in verse twenty nine. He saw it talks about if your eye, sin, if your right eye, uh, sins, in other words, you've got a wandering eye. He said, it's better to pluck it out and go into hell, go into heaven with one eye, than to in hell with both eyes. Okay. He's not saying pluck your eye like some of you have some religions that literally will cut their hands off or pull their eye out, or let a snake bite them. Hmm which is totally against uh, what he says on here. And then he goes in from the eye, he goes into the hand. So if your hand does it, then you cut your hand off and throw it away. It's, he's saying how serious he's taking this, how serious you should take it about hellfire. And he says, he says, uh, he said that you would do this for, for your whole body not be cast into, cast into hell. 
on both these cha- on both these verses. That's verses 29 and 30. Now Matthew 7, 13, and, and then also in verse 19, it says, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. Destruction is hell. Okay? It, it, there's, heaven is not destruction. It's never referred to that. It's, it's just the opposite of destruction. And there will be many who go by it. In other words, if you'll look at it, the 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 other another translation is the road. The the the, the it'll, it, this is not the only place it talks about it. it. Says the road is broad and many take it. It's like a highway, and that's where we got the word highway from. Is from the Bible. Most of the stuff we talk about is words we get are from Scripture. Highway is in the Bible, talking about a wide road, but the gate is something that an individual comes through. Okay, in other words, it's narrow. Many are called, but few are chosen. You've heard that? Okay. Then you go into, again, that's going to be Matthew 7, verse 13 and verse 19. It repeats itself. Now, in verse 19, it says, Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. You say, what the heck does that mean? Well, the the thing is, he's not talking about a physical tree. He's, talk, he's using that as an analogy because this is, remember, this is an agricultural society. They understand this. Uh, like when they're talking about fruit trees, olive trees, wheat, tares, so on and so forth. We're going to get into that. Thrown into the fire, in other words, it's worthless and it's to be burned up and thrown away. Talking about throwing, going into hell, going into the lake of fire, which is a personal choice. Matthew 8, 12. Matthew 8, 12. It says, but the, but the sons, okay, you're looking at this saying, who is he talking about this? Let me read the passage and I'll, I'll explain it. But the sons, lowercase s, of the kingdom will be cast into outer darkness. That is, outer darkness, away from the presence of God, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's like, weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's like, oh, man, they're crying, they're gritting their teeth, and they're just gnashing their teeth, and they're in pain, and they're angry, and they're hurt, and they're cussing God out. The, the, the translation when it says, but the sons of the kingdom, which kingdom? This is going to be the Jewish population, the unbelieving Jewish population. It's his, actual, it's his actual Jewish sons that did not or would not accept Christ as their Savior. They turned from Him. Like those Pharisees that, that turned against Christ and put Him on the cross. Of course, He went on His own free will, but those are, what the, the, those are the sons of the kingdom. They were chosen from Abraham to be the chosen people of God, which they still are. But God is no respecter of persons. You can look that up. Just Google, no respecter of persons in the Bible. So whether you be a good Baptist, good Catholic, good Jew, whatever, if you don't have Christ as your Savior, then he says, I'm no respecter of persons. And these people say, well, you can get to heaven by many means, like Oprah says, you know, there's many ways to God, whatever you call God. Well, Christ specifically said in uh, John 14, 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, period. So did Christ lie or did he just, like someone, again, I had a comment on here that, or actually on YouTube, that maybe Christ had it wrong. He was misunderstood the scriptures. Christ is God. He's the one who made sure they wrote the scriptures through his Holy Spirit correctly. Okay, God doesn't make mistakes. Okay, the next one is, um, this one's going to be repetitive throughout several of these, and I'll, sk- I'll tell you as we're going through here. Matthew 10, 28. Matthew 10, 28, it says, And do not fear those who can kill the body, but ca- but cannot kill the soul. In other words, a human being can put can shoot you like what we, we saw this two weeks ago, but they can't do anything with your soul. They, can, they don't make control. The Catholic Church can't, can't uh, kick you out of the church and say, well, okay, you're going to die and go to hell or make you go to heaven by, by lighting candles and taking money for it to get you out of purgatory because there is no such thing. Uh, Hebrews 9, 27, there is no purgatory. It's once for a person to die, and then there's the judgment, one way or the other. Okay, there's no in between. Well, he's saying, don't fear someone, because no one can put you in hell. No one can put you in heaven except Christ, according to your own free will of your choice or what you made before you died. He's saying, but fear him. Him here is capitalized. This is Jesus Christ, the judge, who is able to destroy both the body and the soul in hell. Destroy. This is where some of my Jehovah Witness friends come in and say, oh, see there, he's going to destroy the body. Your hope is gone. Your hope is crushed. 
you have a you have a body that will last and live forever. But Christ even said in Revelation, which will, um, which uh, Revelation, I want to say twenty or twenty one. He says, uh, read twenty one through twenty two. Uh, I just went blank on it. My brain's uh, I'm going already on, getting on the next subject. Sorry. Anyway, he says, he said, um, cast those off in the lake of fire, which is forever and ever, and fire and brimstone, which is forever and ever. Which he said, the smoke of which will trail up forever. That means in heaven we'll see a, we'll see a pillar of smoke somewhere where it'll be a reminder of God's grace and His mercy and His He offered and it was rejected by most. Okay. We're not going to be able to go in, go into hell and look at them and everything. We're just going to know that's a symbol of like a rainbow that was taken back in you know here in the last twenty years, twenty five years. The rainbow is a symbol of God's promise not to flood the earth. It has nothing to do with sexual perversion, but the but the enemy has turned it into a sexual perversion. And when you see the rainbow flag, obviously it means something different, uh, unless you know the Bible. Um. Also, you can look in uh, Matthew thirteen thirty. Um, oh, okay, yeah, I want to get into this one. Uh, Matthew thirteen thirty. You see the passage where it says, "Oh, one is at the mill, and one is taken. Two are in a bed. One is taken. Two are in the field. One is taken." That is not the rapture. That is not referring to the rapture. I've heard pastors talk about that. This is actually talking about judgment. This is at the end of the seven year tribulation. And also can be at the end of the millennial reign. Here's why. Because the, it's talking about these are taken to judgment. Not to, because if they were believers at the end of the seven year tribulation and they didn't take the mark of the beast and they're out there working with somebody who did take the mark, who's still alive. Because remember, we got those 30 days from the 1260 days, 1260 days, which make up the, the seven years. At the end of that seven years, Christ is coming back and he says he's going to have, there's going to be, 30 days from that time until we get to the judgment, he says he's going to judge the, the, the living and the dead, the quick and the dead. Okay? And those, he's also going to judge those who took the mark of the beast and they'll be taken. Okay? So therefore, he'll literally, if there's two in the field, one's taking the mark and one's a believer, they're still out somewhere on the other side of the planet, not, you know, just trying to survive. Well, if one made his mind up, his or her mind up to follow Satan, the beast, they will be taken. This is what this passage is not referring. This is not the refer, reference like a lot of people do, saying this is a rapture. No, it's not. It's taken to judgment, and it's not just here that says that. Okay, I don't have time to get into that, but if you're wanting to know more, I'd be more than happy to have a conversation with you. Okay, thirteen forty, Matthew thirteen forty. Therefore, as the the tares, that's the weeds which are on the left hand side of Christ at the judgment seat, the unbelievers, the wheat are the the tares and the goats. Even our political system is left and right. You got liberal who are against scriptures. You got conservative who are more leaning toward not all of them. Now that I don't trust any of them, but but that's the the context of what we see. This is um, which verse was on thirteen forty. Therefore, the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so that it will be at the end of this age. What is the end of this age? The end of this age is going to be the end of the seven year tribulation. I believe that's what he's referring to here. Uh, somebody may disagree. This is this is an area where it may it could be a as far as the exact time when he says the end of this age, whether it's at the end of the thousand year reign or at the end of the seven year tribulation at the beginning of the millennial reign. Show me your scripture and I'd be lo I'd love to see it. And I mean seriously, I'm not being facetious, I'm being or sarcastic, I'm being serious. I'd like to learn a little bit more about this passage. So if you have some insight on that, please send it to me. Uh, Matthew thirteen, forty-two, and with these, and they will be cast off into the lake, into or be cast off. Well, he will cast them into a furnace of fire, and there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Okay, repetitive. Thirteen forty-nine through fifty. Matthew talks a lot about this. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth, separate the wicked from amongst the just. Verse fifty, and cast them into a furnace of fire. And there will be wait, uh, there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Again, this is people going, "Oh, it's too late! I can't change my mind. I died. Now I can't do anything about it." Or they're shaking their fist at God for eternity. 
Nothing says you can't, once we are in heaven, you can't sin anymore. Nothing says you can't continue to sin in hell. No, no passages in there. So you can still be cussing and, and having all the sexual, and you can't do anything about it, the frustrations and everything. It doesn't say that you can't sin in hell. It just doesn't, it's just not there. I don't, I mean, so that's something that's interesting. Uh, if you go to Matthew 18, 8, it talks about the same thing. It says you'll be cast out. Uh, it says it'd rather be plucking your eye out or your hand. Again, this is, I told you I was just going to let you know about that one. Same passage. Matthew 18, 9 says the same thing. It says if you don't, you know, it'd be better to keep your mind straight than to be cast into the lake of fire. Um, Matthew 22, 13 is saying the same thing. Um, Matthew 24, 45 through 51. Let's go there. Let's go, let's go ahead and go on into Matthew. This one is, I've got my marker on there for some reason. I don't remember why. Matthew, um, 2445, Matthew 2445. Remember Matthew 24 is where we have all of the judgments and the the tribulation and all that happening and the Antichrist, the abomination of desolation. Uh, 2445 through 51. 45 through 51. Okay. That can't be right. Yes, I guess it is. It says, Who then is a, ser is a faithful and wise servant whom his master made ruler over his household and gave him food in due season? Blessed is the servant who is his master when he comes and will find him doing so. Assuredly, I say to you that he will make him ruler over, of all good things, of all his goods. But if, he, if the evil servant says in his heart, My master is denying, is delaying, and is coming, and begins to beat his fellow servants, and to eat and drink and with drunkards, the master of the servant will come in the day which he is not looking for, not looking for him, and will be at an hour that he is not aware of. This is remember what Christ said. He said, I will come. This is just reiterating. He says, I will come at a time that you are not looking. You are not expecting me. That's believer and unbeliever, obviously. So when my friends here, I know um Shalom. Uh, who he's another messianic believer? We disagree on this point, but we can still agree in love. It can't be during a season, a week. We said Sukkot or Feast of Tabernacles, because, or it could be, but we it's going to be a time that we're not expecting him. If you're a messianic believer, you're expecting him during Sukkot, during that seven day festival. Okay, so and he says, I'll come when you're not looking for me. Okay, during this time, people were a lot more paying attention to their actions. 50. The master of the servant will come in a day that he is not looking for him and an hour that he is not aware of and will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. And there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's the lake of fire. He's talking about, notice how he says servant. If you remember, this is, in, in 25 also goes through with the servant where you have the three and the, you know, three and, and the master leaves who's Jesus Christ, he gives them denari 10 denarii, one, five on the second servant, one on the third servant. And it may say denarii, it, say, it may say mina, same, same. He said he leaves and he comes back after a time that they're not aware of. The first two have doubled what they've got and he blesses them. And the first one that had the least amount of responsibility didn't do anything. He said, you wicked servant. He took away his blessings and gave it to the one that had the most. So not only... Are you or the, the 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 let me back up? The master in the in verse twenty five or chapter twenty five and twenty four is Jesus Christ. What was given to him is the word of God. And the servants are the people who were given this opportunity. So if you're a Billy Graham, you're you, you're you're too much to whom much is given, much is required. If you're only given this much, that's all you're required to. But if you're only, get, let's say, just as an example, you're only supposed to talk to 10 people in your whole life and you talk to one, well, then you've only done 10%. Okay? You, you get the concept. You still have the same opportunity for growth and spirit, or spirit, or heavenly prosperity. Because if he gave you a thousand and you spoke to a hundred, that's still only 10%, right? And you kind of get the idea. And he's real easy on this. He says, he says, 
if you're the disobedient one, he said, I'll cut in two. This is actually kill, actually uh, dis, uh, just dishonor. And this is going, and he says, and he says, you know, we go into where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's hell. That's the judgment seat. The unbelievers, the white throne judgment of Revelation 20, verse 11. So that's where you'll be going there. Okay. So that's what he's talking about here. So he's, Jesus doesn't beat around the bush. He's never, let's see, come on. My, my computer is, come on, wake up. Oh, Lord, okay, there we go. Scared me for a second. <laughs> like, oh man, come on, we were doing good. Um, also, uh, this one's important too. Matthew seven twenty one through twenty three. Matthew seven twenty one through twenty three. People say, "Well, I believe in Jesus. I believe in God." Like Oprah and oh, the, the these false pastors, like you know, like I keep saying, on you know, you see the Jesse Duplantis and all these other people who are, you know, you just believe in Jesus. You just ask Him into your heart, and you'll be saved, and you're part of a church. Welcome to the family. You're still just as lost as you were before you walked in. And the reason I say that is because there's no there's no repentance, there's no regeneration to knowing that you have to repent of sin. They're very careful not to point out your sin because that would offend you and you take your wallet and go somewhere else. But the the, the thing is there's gonna be a lot of people. This passage applies to Christians, not to Muslims or Buddhists or anybody else who doesn't believe in Jesus. But people who think who believe say they believe in Jesus, but they're lost. That means believing in Jesus doesn't save you. The demons believe in Jesus, but they're not going to go to heaven. But it's believing on what He did, who He is. He's God the Son. He, you know, we we have to repent, turn from our sins, and realize He went to the cross and shed His blood, God's blood for our sins, and became an atoning sacrifice for us. Became sin for us. Died. Rose again three days later and is at the right hand of the Father. And to believe this and to grab onto it like you would a parachute if, if you're jumping out of an airplane. Just it's not just a warm and fuzzy feeling or feeling in the bosom, and then you think you're good. No. This passage I'm getting ready to read is going to offend you if you're a Christian, if you think you're a Christian and you're not. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I don't know your hearts. Because people don't claim to do this if they're not a Christian. If they, if they don't think they're a Christian. This is at the judgment seat. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, who's me? That's Christ. Lord, Lord, uppercase L, lowercase O-R-D, that's Jesus. Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name and didn't we drive out demons in your name and perform many miracles in your name? Then I, Christ, will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. This is people whose sins are unforgiven who are sitting in the pews of a church. 80%, according to the Pew Research, go look it up. 15 years ago, I think it was 15, 18 years ago, something like that. It's the last time I looked at it because it scared me. Because I, I, I was in this number not back before I was 31. Was that They say an average of 80% 80 to 95% of the people sit in most churches as a whole. Some churches may have 95%, some may have 1%. But as a whole, they did a, did a survey. They, the average was between 20% as a high number and 5% as a low number of people that saved in, in most churches. Let that sink in. It means you got a lot, of, you look around, most people in church. Overall, won't be there when you at the, and you won't miss them because if you did it, would make, if I knew that one of my family members or a friend or whatever wasn't there, and because if they're not there at the at the bema seat, that means they're somewhere else. That would just rip my guts out. And that's God says there's no more pain, no more sorrow for the former things have passed away. And that means the sorrow would be if what if it was one of my kids? I mean, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying what if it was one of the kids or a spouse or something? I mean, just uh, hmm. He said, Matthew 25, 41, he says, Then he shall say also to those on his left hand, remember the ones on his left hand, this is Christ at the at the white throne judgment at uh, Revelation 20, 11. He said that he will say to those on his left hand, on the left hand of his throne, 
Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. This loving God is a God of justice also. He said, well, God is love, is love, is love, is love, and I can commit any kind of sin or perversion I want to. As long as I'm monogamous, as long as I love Jesus, I can go out here and do this. If I was going out saying, hey, I'm going to go out and, and, and beat my wife only on Thursdays, and I'm only going to go out and cheat and commit adultery on Thursdays, but I'm going to be a really good guy, really go to church and really pray. I'll do everything else, but this isn't a sin. That means I'm guilty of that sin and it's not forgiven because I'm not confessing it, am I? I can, how is God going to forgive you of a sin that you do not confess? And if you have this type of thinking, you're not saved in the first place. Because if you were saved, you would have the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Do believers commit adultery? Yes. Do, committer, do believers commit uh, homosexuality? Yes. And murder? Yes. But they're, the conviction to come back and repent but if you get into a lifestyle of it to where you're diving off and into you crave it and you don't and you say, Oh, it's okay, and you accept it and you're just you don't see you don't have any conviction of the sin, then no. He says you were never up you were never of us in the first place. You go to Hebrews chapter uh, eight and, and chapter ten, and it reads on that one. Okay, I don't have time to go through that one. Uh, Matthew twenty five, forty six, and we'll get out of this uh, book. And these will go away into everlasting punishment. Everlasting. Notice it says eternal and everlasting. That doesn't mean you burn up and then you're gone. He says everlasting because if it was temporary, it's a until you've got your sins burned up or whatever he say for a long period of time. Christ is saying everlasting fire, everlasting punishment. That's eternal. Eternal. I mean, it, there's, it doesn't make, there's no grammatical structure saying that anything in Scripture saying that it's temporary. But the righteous shall, shall enter into eternal life, just the opposite. In Mark chapter 3, 20, uh, 3, 28 through 30, yeah, I'm going to read this one. Assuredly, I say unto you that all sins will be forgiven this, to the sons of men. You know where I'm going here. You've heard of uh, the unforgivable sin, the unpardonable sin. You can reread it. And if you're asking if you've done it, then you're good because no, you haven't. If it bothered you thinking you might have done it by accident, there's no accident here. This is on a purpose. And the way he's going to tell us is that when you commit this sin, you're doing it of free will and of complete thought, knowing the scriptures, knowing what you're what you were doing, like uh, like in Roman or uh, uh, Hebrews chapter ten, where uh, you know what you're doing and you do it on purpose, knowing what you read and been offered it, and you know it's correct and you still reject it. Okay. A believer who even who's rotten in the core but still is struggling is not going to do this. Okay. Assuredly, I say unto you that, that all sins will be forgiven of the sons of men. That's us. And whatsoever blasphemies they may utter. Okay, that's blasphemies against the Father and the Son. This is only the first, only one place that's telling this. That means if you blaspheme Christ, you can be forgiven. If you blaspheme the Father, you can be forgiven. I don't understand this. I have an issue with this. I don't understand why, but if you, but if you said, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy God, the Holy Spirit, never has forgiveness, but is subject to eternal condemnation because they said he has an unclean spirit. This is when the when the Pharisees told Christ, the reason you're able to do all these miracles and, and heal people is because you have a bigger demon in you, telling the little demons to get out of the people, so it gave you. Credibility. He said, you have just committed the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. So we have people that are going online saying, I commit, you know, the I deny, and they're doing it of all free will and not knowledge. According to what this says, this still applies. Yeah, I have there I have a am I hundred percent on this? No. Am I ninety percent? Yes. It's this one bothers this is one of the ones that bothers me. Verse, uh, chapter 9, verse 43 through 48. I don't know if I'm going to read all that. Just real quick. If your hand, you know, causes you to, same thing as in Matthew, it says if your hand or your eye causes you to sin, you chop it off. He says, so that you don't go into hell, into the hell fire that shall never be quenched and where the worm does not die and the fire is never quenched. And I'm going to go through all uh, 43 through 48. So I'm going to tell you, what, you can look at that passage. I'm just going to read these excerpts. It says, and it says again, in the fire that shall never be quenched, and the worm shall never die, 
and the fire is never quenched. Where the worm never dies and the fire is never quenched. He's stressing a point. It's repetitive. He's stressing a point that hell is not a good place. It's the best place in hell or in the lake of fire still sit in the middle of a, of a... Just picture this. We have burn piles here where I'm at. And you burn and it gets so hot because you've got so much stuff in there. And during the, in August when you're burning and the fire is... You, 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 you got to cover your eyes, wear glasses because it's so hot. Just picture taking off your clothes and walking into the middle of it and just sitting there and getting snuggled up in there and just, and just sitting there. That's not even... That's not even as bad as what this is talking about because also you'll have it in your mind. It, it, it won't kill you. You'll just suffer and, you'll, and the pain will never go away. It'll never desensitize. Okay. Let's go into Luke. Luke says the same thing in 3.17. Luke 3.17. Luke 12.5. Eh, let me read this one. Luke 12.5. But I will show you that to whom you should fear. Fear him who... After he has ki was has killed, has has power cast you into hell. Yes, I say, fear him who can do this. This is Christ. Hmm. After he was killed, who was killed? Christ on the cross. Luke twelve forty six through forty eight. The master of the servant came home one day when he was not looking for him, and at the hour that he was not aware, and he cut it, and it, he cut him into two. It, cut him in two, and appointed him his portion with the unbelievers. In other words, this was a, someone who claimed to be a servant, a false believer. This is what we just talked about. He's very clear this is a false believer. Someone who goes to church or claims to be Christian and is lost because they do not have a, a, a proper, a, a, an actual relationship with Jesus Christ. So he says, I'm going to take your portion you were supposed to go with me, but you didn't do that because you were you did not repent and turn from your sins and turn to Christ. So I'm a Christian. I believe. I wear a cross. I got a fish on my back of my car. Doesn't matter. It's called a hypocrite. Just like these televangelists that are getting by with it are are this is them. If they believe their own stuff, if they believe their own lies. He says that and that servant who who knew his master's will, in other words, he knew what he's supposed to do, and did not prepare himself or or do according do according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. That means the level of torment. The level of torment in your final judgment is what this means. He's saying, I'm going to judge you according to what you deserve. Okay, you had an opportunity. It says in Hebrews, again, those that were never given the opportunity, or were they, they just rejected, they never got into it, and they just stayed with their their uh their idols, are not going to be held in in as much torment as those who were given the scriptures got a taste of it and then turned from it because they're going to be held more accountable. And he says your torment will be more. So if you're listening to this video, you're going to, and you refuse, you're going to, there's more torment and a, a higher level of torment in the lake of fire than someone who listened to it, heard it back years ago and just never went to it, went to Buddhism, or whatever, and just never came out of it because those that have taste of it in Hebrews, like I say in Hebrews, Chapter eight in Hebrews chapter or chapter ten, uh, and I'll, I'll I'm trying to remember the exact verse. Um, I guess I keep talking about it, so maybe I should look at it. Oh, man, this one's sorry for the the time frame, folks. Apparently, I'm supposed to say this for somebody. I'm not sure who. Uh, Hebrews 10, 26. Well, first of all, I'm going to read this one at 8. 8, 4 through 6. Hebrews 8, or 6, 6, 4, 6, chapter 6, verse 4 through 6. For it is impossible for those who are once enlightened to have tasted the heavenly gift and to, and to become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of God of this of the age to come, if they fall away to renew them to, to be able to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God, that's Jesus, and put him to an put him to open shame. This is somebody who's had all this and then turned from it. Ten twenty six is different. Ten twenty six is different. 
It says, for if we sinfully or uh, for if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there is no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. Okay, that's someone who hears the gospel and rejects it. The other one is a someone who goes way deeper and is accepted, and they say, Oh, like, you know, I'm I'm a believer and I've gone to church and I've read the Bible, and it never stuck. And then they turn away from it. And they go the opposite direction. They're held to a higher standard and they will be judged more harshly. Okay. Um, let me see. Let's go ahead and go in the book of John. I'll skip through. John 5.29. I'm just going to read just a portion of it. And those that came forth and those who have done good to the resurrection will go to the resurrection of life. That's heaven. But to those who have done evil, to the resurrection of condemnation, to the lake of fire. He says, you're going to get what you pay for. You're going to get what you deserve, good or bad. If you're in heaven, we don't answer for our sins. We will answer for the time we spent away from Christ and what we did with what He, with what he gave us. Remember about the three servants? What you did with, no one's going to be, there's not going to be 100% up there on anybody. But I would rather have 1% of something than 100% of nothing. You'll still be happy. You'll still be in heaven. You'll have a job, and you'll be blissfully, you know. Christ says, "No one, no one knows what God has in store for those who love Him. No eye has seen, nor ear has heard, no heart has conceived what God has in store for those who love Him." This is what's coming. We're, we we can't imagine. There's not words to be able to describe how good it is. But again, the more you serve Christ, the more He says, "Do not store up your treasures on earth, where wrath and Rust and moth destroy and thieves steal, but store up your treasures in heaven where moth and rust and th do not destroy and thieves steal. That's something that's eternal. There's 13 different places in the, in the New Testament where it talks about prosperity. The best one is, is go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 13, which we just spoke about at the judgment seat. Wood, hay, and stubble, good, gold, silver, and precious stones. That's the best one to look at. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 13. And it correlates with 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. Okay. Um, here's one that's going to make a lot of people mad, and I've said this before. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 through 11. It says, Now, therefore, if it is already an utter failure, utter, utter failure for you to go again to go to the law against one go to law against one another. So we're suing a Christian, each other. Why do you not rather accept the wrong then? Rather that they're in rather to let yourselves be cheated and let yourselves be cheated. No, you yourselves do wrong and you still cheat and you do these things to your own brethren. In other words, you're a hypocrite. It said, do you not know the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? This is go to hell. Do you not do, do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites. That means male or female. Homosexual is, is male or female because he specifically says sodomite. Only a male is able, able to commit sodomy. I mean, I'm not going to explain that to you. i got young years. But you explain that to your children. But there is a difference. Both are, uh, he says, sodomites. Sodomy, that's where it came from, from Sodom, because that's what they practiced. He said, he said no adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such of some of you were, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the, the Holy Spirit of our God. In other words, it says you may have been this way, and you may be suffering from it, but if you repent, he said you were, past tense, it's fixable. If you're breathing, as long as you're breathing, you have a chance. Let me go ahead and go real quick through here. I won't go into the other one. You know, people call, it says for the, in 1 Corinthians 1.18, it says, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing or going to hell, but to those of us who are being saved is the power of God. The wor don't expect the world to understand this. Don't expect the world to understand why we're doing what we're doing, because they follow a different God. Just like those ones that the people, the individuals that murdered all those people, is that are following the same God in uh, John, John chapter eight verse forty four. It says, "You follow your, you follow your, your father, the devil." People who are doing that are, that are in this religion that are doing all this stuff, 
is the same God that is here and all around the world that are molesting these children here and that are cheating and lying and get up in front of people and, and taking money out of your wallet and trying to be in there and that are that are cheating and they're not Christian. It says, beware of those that uh, it says they will use they will uh, they will use the word to to gain profit. That's going to be these false preachers, these name it and claim it, and you know, like the Joel Steens and them. These are false preachers. Okay, they will pay for that if they believe what they are. They'll be held accountable at the White Throne Judgment. Um, Galatians five nineteen through twenty one and verse twenty four also. It tells us, it says, I say, I say to you then, walk in the Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, and you shall be fruitful, and you shall not fulfill, excuse me, you shall not fulfill, let me put my glasses on, it'll be easier to see. Oh, that's better, much better. Walk in the Holy Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. In other words, whatever kind of sin you, that is your flavor. For the, fl the flesh lusts against the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not, so that you do not do the things that you wish. Paul struggled with this, but if you are led by the Holy Spirit, you are not under the law. In other words, he's going to tell you what you can and can't do, and you're not. You're going to have a desire to follow him. Okay. It says now, verse nineteen. It says now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication. That means sex outside of marriage, uncleanliness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery. That means Harry Potter, all that. Mediums, palm reading, that's sorcery. That's witchcraft. Witchcraft is demonism. White path, black path, same thing. Hatred, contentions, jealousy, outburst of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, rivalries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in the times past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Therefore, Ephesians, let me finish with this. This is our last sentence. Ephesians 5, verse 1 through 7, or just through 5. Therefore, be imitators of God, dear children, and walk in love as Christ has also loved us and given himself for us as an offering and as a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. In other words, Christ did everything for us. That's the end of the study. The, if you're following a Jesus that is not God Almighty, who he claimed to be, and you can go to pray5.org and you can uh, look under Is Christ God? And it'll, I've got it all written down there. Um, so I don't have to reiterate it, but Christ is God. Christ came, it says he came in the image of, he came in the image of sinful flesh. He wouldn't sin. And I've heard preachers say, well, he, he had to ask once he uh, first thing he had to do when he got down the cross was ask you know was to be born again. How can you be born again if if you're sin if you're sinful you can't forgive somebody else's sin you have to die for your own sins and to say that Christ had to uh, had to die for his own sin is blasphemy because he's God he was he was the sinless Lamb of God the sinless Lamb of God so if, if that's what the scripture says so if a man changes that that's blasphemy. He'll pay for that. Know that Christ went to the cross and he said, I'll die. I'll pay for every sin, even no matter how atrocious. I'll die for every sin there is. If you repent and turn to me, turn from your sin, accept that I came and died for the sins of the world. I am God. He's God Almighty. Came, lived a sinless life, came by the virgin, lived a sinless life, went to the cross. He didn't deserve to die for sins he never committed. And he, he poured out his blood and he, he paid for the sins with his own blood. And he says, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And on that cross, he said, Ten less die, which means it's finished, it's completed. It's a covenant between God and man. And then there he made a way for us to pray directly to the Father. We don't need a priest to pray to God. We pray directly to the Father if we're saved. If you're not saved, then the only prayer that God will hear is the prayer of salvation, repentance and salvation. Realize he went to the grave and rose three days later and is now at the right hand of the Father. Read the book of John and read the book of Romans. And after you finish it, go back and read it again. Tell you who Christ is, why we need him, and how to be saved. Wow. Here comes the rain. Let's go ahead and pray. I'll see you next Wednesday and I'll be talking on 
looks like I'll be talking on, on, on some more light, light stuff as far as heaven. Father, thank you for this time together. We ask for your blessings, your mercy, your grace. And we ask that anyone who's listening who is not saved, open their eyes to the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Please be with Israel, protect her, and give her victory on the battlefield. And may the, may the guilty be found and the innocent be protected on both sides. And that the enemy be, be vanquished. And spread your gospel throughout both sides. We ask these things in the name of our Messiah, Jesus Christ, Yeshua. Amen. We'll see you next Wednesday.